at the dawn of the 19th century in a cellar in Mayfair, the most famous scientist of the time, Humphrey Davy, built an extraordinary piece of electrical equipment. Four meters wide, twice as long, and containing stinking stacks of acid and metal. It had been created to pump out more electricity than had ever been possible before. It was, in fact, the biggest battery the world had ever seen. And with it, Davy was about to propel us into a new age. That moment would take place at a lecture at the Royal Institution in front of hundreds of London's great and good. Filled with anticipation, they packed the seats, hoping to witness a new and exciting electrical wonder. But what they would see that night would be something truly unique, something they'd remember for the rest of their lives. Using just two simple carbon rods, Humphrey Davy was about to unleash the true potential of electricity. Electricity is one of nature's most awesome phenomena, and the most powerful manifestation of it we ever see is lightning. This is the story of how we first dreamed of controlling this primal force of nature and how we would ultimately become its master. It's a 300-year tale of dazzling leaps of imagination and extraordinary experiments. Tens of thousands of volts passed across his body and through the end of a lamp that he was holding. It's a story of maverick geniuses who used electricity to light our cities, to communicate across the seas and through the air, to create modern industry, and to give us the digital revolution. But in this film, we'll tell the story of the very first scientists who started to unlock the mysteries of electricity. This is, there's something alive in there. They studied its curious link to life, built strange and powerful instruments to create it, and even tamed lightning itself. It was these men who truly laid the foundations of the modern world. And it all started with a spark. Imagine our world without electricity. It will be dark, cold, and quiet. In many ways, it will be like the beginning of the 18th century, where our story begins. This is the Royal Society in London. In the early 1700s, after years in the wilderness, Isaac Newton finally took control of it after the death of his arch enemy, Robert Hooke. Newton brought in his own people to the key jobs to help shore up his new position. The new head of demonstrations there was 35-year-old Francis Hawkesby. Notes from the Royal Society in 1705 reveal how hard Hawkesby tried to stamp his personality on its weekly meetings, producing ever more spectacular experiments to impress his masters. In November, he came up with this, a rotating glass sphere. He was able to remove the air from inside it using a new machine, the air pump. On his machine, a handle allowed him to spin the sphere. One by one, the candles in the room were put out. And Francis placed his hand against the sphere. The audience were about to see something amazing.
Inside the glass sphere, a strange ethereal light began to form, dancing around his hand. A light no one had ever seen before. Oh, that's fantastic. You see a beautiful blue glow it's just marking out the shape of my hands, but then going right round the ball. It's as though there's something alive in there. It's difficult to really understand why this dancing blue light meant so much. But we have to bear in mind that at the time, natural phenomena like this were seen to be the work of the Almighty. This was still a period when, even in Isaac Newton's theory, God was constantly intervening in the conduct of the world. And so it made sense for a lot of people to interpret natural phenomena as acts of God. So when a mere mortal meddled with God's work, it was almost beyond rational comprehension. Hawkesby never realised the full significance of his experiment. He lost interest in his glowing sphere and spent the last few years of his life building ever more spectacular experiments for Isaac Newton to test his other theories. He never realised that he'd unwittingly started an electrical revolution. Before Hawkesby, electricity had been merely a curiosity. The ancient Greeks rubbed amber, which they called electron, to get small shocks. And even Queen Elizabeth I marvelled at static electricity's power to lift feathers. But now, Hawkesby's machine could make electricity at the turn of a handle. And you could see it. And perhaps even more importantly, his invention coincided with the birth of a new movement sweeping across Europe, called the Enlightenment. Enlightened intellectuals used reason to question the world, and their legacy was radical politics, iconoclastic art, and natural philosophy, or science. But ironically, Hawkesby's new machine wasn't immediately embraced by most of these intellectuals, but instead by conjurers and street magicians. And those with an interest in electricity called themselves electricians. One story tells of a dinner party attended by an Austrian count. The electrician had placed some feathers on the table and then charged up a glass rod with a silk handkerchief. He then astonished the guests by lifting up the feathers with the rod. He then went on to charge himself up using one of Hawkesby's electrical machines and gave the guests electric shocks, presumably to squeals of delight. But for his pièce de résistance, he placed a glass of cognac in the centre of the table charged himself up again and lit it with a spark from the tip of his finger. There was a trick called the electrical beatification in which the victim sits on an insulated chair and above his head hangs a metal crown that doesn't quite touch his head. And then if the crown is electrified, then you get an electric discharge around the crown that looks exactly like a halo, which is why it's called the electric beatification. As England and the rest of Europe went electricity crazy, the spectacles grew bigger, and the more curious electricians started to ask more profound questions. Not only how can we make our shows bigger and better, but how can we control this amazing power? And for some, can this incredible electrical fire do more than just entertain? One of the first early breakthroughs would never have happened had it not been for a terrible accident. 
This is Charterhouse in the centre of London. Over the past 400 years, it's been a charitable home for young orphans and elderly gentlemen. And sometime in the 1720s, it also became home to one Stephen Gray. Stephen Gray had been a successful silk dyer from Canterbury. He was used to seeing electric sparks leap from the silk, and they fascinated him. Unfortunately, a crippling accident ended his career and left him destitute. But then he was offered a new life here at Charterhouse, and with it, the time to perform his own electrical experiments. Here at Charterhouse, possibly in this very room, the Great Chamber, Stephen Gray built a wooden frame. From the top beam, he suspended two swings using silk rope. He also had a device like this, a Hawksby machine, for generating static electricity. Now, with a large audience in attendance, he got one of the orphan boys who lived here at Charterhouse to lie across the two swings. Gray placed some gold leaf in front of him. He then generated electricity and charged the boy through a connecting rod. Gold leaf, even feathers, leapt to the boy's fingers. Some of the audience claimed they could even see sparks flying out from his fingertips. Show business indeed. But to the curious and inquiring mind of Stephen Gray, this said something else as well. Electricity could move. From the machine to the boy's body through to his hands. But the silk rope stopped it dead. It meant the mysterious electrical fluid could flow through some things, but not through others. It led Gray to divide the world into two different kinds of substances. He called them insulators and conductors. Insulators held electric charge within them and wouldn't let it move, like the silk or hair, glass and resin, whereas conductors allowed electricity to flow through them, like the boy or metals. It's a distinction which is still crucial even today. Just think of these electric pylons. They work on the same principle that Gray deduced nearly 300 years ago. The wires are conductors. The glass and ceramic objects between the wire and the metal of the pylon are insulators that stop the electricity leaking from the wires into the pylon and down to the earth. They're just like the silk ropes in Gray's experiment. Back in the 1730s, Gray's experiment may have astounded all who saw it, but it had a frustrating drawback. Try as he might, Gray couldn't contain the electricity he was generating for long. It leapt from the machine to the boy and was quickly gone. The next step in our story came when we learnt how to store electricity. But that would take place not in Britain, but across the channel in mainland Europe. (laughs) 
across the channel, electricians were just as busy as their British counterparts. And one center for electrical research was here in Leiden, Holland. And it was here that a professor came up with an invention that many still regard as the most significant of the 18th century. One that, in some form or another, can still be found in almost every electrical device today. That professor was Pieter van Muschenbroek. Unlike Hawksby and Gray, Muschenbroek was born into academia. But ironically enough, his breakthrough came not because of his rigorous science, but because of a simple human mistake. He was trying to find a way to store electrical charge ready for his demonstrations. And you can almost hear his train of thought as he tries to figure this out. If electricity is a fluid that flows a bit like water, then maybe you can store it in the same way that you can store water. So Muschenbroek went to his laboratory to try to make a device to store electricity. Muschenbroek started to think literally. He took a glass jar and poured in some water. He then placed inside it a length of conducting wire which was connected at the top to a Hawksby electric machine. Then he put the jar on an insulator to help keep the charge in the jar. He then tried to pour the electricity into the jar produced by the machine via the wire down through into the water. But whatever he tried, the charge just wouldn't stay in the jar. Then one day, by accident, he forgot to put the jar on the insulator but charged it instead while it was still in his hand. Finally, holding the jar with one hand, he touched the top with the other and received such a powerful electric shock, he was almost thrown to the ground. He writes, it's a new but terrible experiment which I advise you never to try, nor would I, who've experienced it and survived by the grace of God, do it again for all the kingdom of France. So I'm going to heed his advice, not touch the top, but instead see if I can get a spark off of it. The sheer power of the electricity which flew from the jar was greater than any seen before. And even more surprisingly, the jar could store that electricity for hours, even days. So in honor of the city where Muschenbroek made his discovery, they called it the Leiden Jar. And its fame swept across the world. And very rapidly from 1745 through the rest of the 1740s, the news of this, it's called the Leiden Jar, goes global. It spreads from Japan in East Asia to Philadelphia in Eastern America. It became one of the first quick globalized scientific news items. But although the Leiden Jar became a global electrical phenomenon, no one had the slightest idea how it worked. You have a jar of electric fluid, and it turns out that you get a bigger shock from the jar if you allow the electric fluid to drain away to the earth. Why is the shock bigger if the jar's leaking? Why isn't the shock bigger if you make sure that all the electric fluid stays inside the jar? That was how mid-18th century electrical philosophers were faced with this challenge. Electricity was without doubt a fantastical wonder. It could shock and spark. It could now be stored and moved around. Yet what electricity was, how it worked, and why it did all these things, 
was nothing less than a complete mystery. Within 10 years, a new breakthrough was to come from an unexpected quarter. From a man politically and philosophically at war with the London establishment. And even more shockingly for the British electrical elite, that man was merely a colonial, an American. This painting of Benjamin Franklin hangs here at the Royal Society in London. Franklin was a passionate supporter of American emancipation and saw the pursuit of rational science and particularly electricity as a way of rolling back ignorance, false idols and ultimately his intellectually elitist colonial masters. And this is mixed with um, a profoundly egalitarian democratic idea that Franklin and his allies have, which is, this is a phenomenon open to everyone. Here's something that the elite doesn't really understand, and we might be able to understand it. Here's something that the elite can't really control, but we might be able to control. And here's something, above all, which is the source of superstition. And we, rational, egalitarian, potentially democratic intellectuals, we will be able to reason it out without appearing to be the slaves of magic or mystery. So Franklin decided to use the power of reason to rationally explain what many considered a magical phenomenon, lightning. This is probably one of the most famous scientific images of the 18th century. It shows Benjamin Franklin, the heroic scientist, flying a kite in a storm, proving that lightning is electrical. But although Franklin proposed this experiment, he almost certainly never performed it. Much more likely, is that his most significant experiment was another one, which he proposed but didn't even conduct. In fact, it didn't even happen in America. It took place here in a small village north of Paris called marly le ville The French adored Franklin, especially his anti-British politics, and they took it upon themselves to perform his other lightning experiments without him. I've come to the very spot where that experiment took place. In May 1752, George Louis Leclerc, known across France as the Comte de Buffon, and his friend Thomas Francois Delibar, erected a 40 foot metal pole, more than twice as high as this one held in place by three wooden staves just outside Delibar's house here in marly le -Ville. The metal pole rested at the bottom inside an empty wine bottle. Franklin's big idea had been that the long pole would capture the lightning, pass it down the metal rod and store it in the wine bottle at the base, which worked as a Leiden jar. Then he could confirm what lightning actually was. All his French followers had to do was wait for a storm. And then on May 23rd, the heavens opened. At 12.20, a loud thunderclap was heard as lightning hit the top of the pole. An assistant ran to the bottle a spark leapt across between the metal and his finger with a loud crack and a sulphurous smell, burning his hand. The spark revealed lightning for what it really was. It was the same as the electricity made by man. It's hard to overestimate the significance of this moment. Nature had been mastered. Not only that, but the wrath of God itself had been brought under the control of mankind. 
It was a kind of heresy. Franklin's experiment was very important because it showed that lightning storms produce or are produced by electricity and that you can bring this um, electricity down, that electricity is a force of nature that's waiting out there to be tapped. Next, Franklin turned his rational mind to another question. Why the Leiden jar made the bigger sparks when it was held in the hand? Why didn't all the electricity just drain away? And drawing on his experience as a successful businessman, he saw something no one else had. That, like money in a bank, electricity can be in credit, what he called positive, or debit, negative. For him, the problem of the Leiden jar is a problem of accountancy. Franklin's idea was every body has around it an electrical atmosphere. And there's a natural amount of electric fluid around each body. If there's too much, we'll call it positive. If there's too little, we'll call it negative. And nature is organized, so the positives and the negatives always want to balance out, like an ideal American economy. Franklin's insight was that electricity was actually just positive charge flowing to cancel out negative charge. And he believed this simple idea could solve the mystery of the Leiden jar. As the jar is charged up, negative electrical charge is poured down the wire and into the water. If the jar rests on an insulator, a small amount builds up in the water. But if instead the jar is held by someone as it's being charged, positive electric charge is sucked up through their body from the ground to the outside of the jar, trying to cancel out the negative charge inside. But the positive and negative charges are stopped from cancelling out by the glass, which acts as an insulator. So instead, the charge just grows and grows on both sides of the glass. Then, touching the top of the jar with the other hand completes a circuit, allowing the negative charge on the inside to pass through the hand to the positive on the outside, finally cancelling it out. The movement of this charge causes a massive shock and often a spark. The modern equivalent of the Leiden jar is this, the capacitor. And it's one of the most ubiquitous of electronic components. It's found everywhere. There are a number of smaller ones scattered around on this circuit board from a computer. They help smooth out electrical surges, protecting sensitive components, even in the most modern electric circuit. Solving the mystery of the Leiden jar and recognising lightning as merely a kind of electricity were two great successes for Franklin and the New Enlightenment movement. But the forces of trade and commerce, which helped fuel the Enlightenment, were about to throw up a new and even more perplexing electrical mystery, a completely new kind of electricity. This is the English Channel. By the 17th and 18th centuries, a good fraction of the world's wealth flowed up this stretch of water from all corners of the British Empire and beyond, on its way to London. Spices from India, sugar from the Caribbean, wheat from America, tea from China. But of course, it wasn't just commerce. New plant and animal specimens from all over the world came flooding into London including one 
that particularly fascinated the electricians. Called the torpedo fish, it'd been the stuff of fishermen's tails. Its sting, it was said, was capable of knocking a grown man down. But as the electricians started to investigate the sting, they realised it felt strangely similar to a shock from a Leiden jar. Could its sting actually be an electric shock? At first, many people dismissed the torpedo fish's shock as a cult. Some said it was probably just the fish biting. Others, that it couldn't be a shock because without a spark, it just wasn't electricity. But for most, this was a very strange and inexplicable new mystery. And it would take one of the oddest, yet most brilliant characters in British science to begin to unlock the secrets of the torpedo fish. This is the only picture in existence of the pathologically shy but exceptional Henry Cavendish. This one only exists because an artist sketched his coat as it hung on a peg, then filled in the face from memory. His family were fantastically rich. They were the Devonshires, who still own Chatsworth House in Derbyshire. But Henry Cavendish decided to turn his back on his family's wealth and status, to live in London near his beloved Royal Society, where he could quietly pursue his passion for experimental science. When he heard about the electric torpedo fish, he was intrigued. A friend wrote to him, On this, my first experience of the effect of the torpedo, I exclaimed that this is certainly electricity. But how? And to work out how a living thing could produce electricity, he decided to make his own artificial fish. These are his plans. Two Leiden jars shaped like the fish, which were buried under sand. When the sand was touched, they discharged, giving a nasty shock. His model helped convince him that the real torpedo fish was electric. But it still left him with a nagging problem. Although both the real fish and Cavendish's artificial one gave powerful electric shocks, the real fish never sparked. Cavendish was perplexed. How could it be the same kind of electricity if they didn't both do the same kinds of things? Cavendish spent the winter of 1773 in his laboratory, trying to come up with an answer. And in the spring, he had a brainwave. Cavendish's ingenious answer was to point out a subtle distinction between the amount of electricity and its intensity. The real fish produced the same kind of electricity, it's just that it was less intense. Now, for a physicist like me, this marks a crucial turning point because it's the moment when two genuinely innovative scientific ideas first crop up. What Cavendish refers to as the amount of electricity we now call electric charge. And his intensity is what we call the potential difference or voltage. So the Leiden jar's shock was high voltage but low charge, whereas the fish was low voltage and high charge. And it's possible to actually measure that. Hiding at the bottom of this tank under the sand is the torpedo marmorata, and it's an electric ray. You can just see its eyes protruding from the sand. This is a fully grown female, and I'm going to try and measure the electricity it gives off with this bait. I've got this fish connected to a metal rod and hooked up to an oscilloscope to see if I can measure the voltage as it catches its prey. So here goes. Oh, there's one.
and there's another one. The fish gave a shock of about 240 volts, the same as mains electricity, but still roughly 10 times less than the Leiden jar. Well, that would have given me quite a nasty shock. And I can only try and imagine what it must have been like for scientists in the 18th century to witness this. An animal, a fish, producing its own electricity. Cavendish had shown that the torpedo fish made electricity. But he didn't know if it was the same kind of electricity as that made from an electrical machine. Is the electrical shock that a torpedo produces, is it the same as produced by an electrical machine? Or are there two kinds? Is there a kind that's generated artificially, or is there a kind of animal electricity that only exists in living bodies? And this was a huge debate that divided opinion for several decades. And out of that bitter debate came a new discovery the discovery that electricity needn't be a brief shock or spark, but could actually be continuous. And the generation of continuous electricity would ultimately propel us into our modern age. But the next step in the story of electricity would come about because of a fierce personal and professional rivalry between two Italian academics. This is Bologna University, one of the oldest in Europe. In the late 18th century, the city of Bologna was ruled from Papal Rome, which meant that the university was powerful but conservative in its thinking. It was steeped in traditional Christianity, one where God ruled Earth from heaven, but that the way he ran the world was hidden from us mere mortals. We were not meant to understand him, only to serve him and one of the university's brightest stars was the anatomist Luigi Alisio Galvani. But in a neighbouring city, a rival electrician was about to take Galvani to task. This is Pavia, only 150 miles from Bologna, but by the end of the 18th century, worlds apart politically. It was part of the Austrian Empire which put it at the very heart of the European Enlightenment. Liberal in its thinking, politically radical and obsessed with the new science of electricity. It was also home to Alessandro Volta. Alessandro Volta couldn't have been more unlike Galvani. From an old Lombardy family, he was young, arrogant, charismatic, a real ladies' man, and he courted controversy. Unlike Galvani, he liked to show off his experiments on an international stage to any audience. Volta's ideas were unfettered by Galvani's religious dogma. Like Benjamin Franklin and the European Enlightenment, he believed in rationality. That scientific truth, like a Greek god, would cast ignorance to the floor. Superstition was the enemy, reason was the future. Both men were fascinated by electricity and both brought their different ways of seeing the world to bear on it. Galvani had been attracted to the use of electricity in medical treatments. For instance, in 1759, here in Bologna, electricity was used on the muscles of a paralyzed man. One report said it was a fine sight to see the mastoid rotate the head, the biceps bend the elbow. 
In short, to see the force and vitality of all the motions occurring in every paralyzed muscle subjected to the stimulus. Galvani believed these kinds of examples revealed that the body worked using animal electricity, a fluid that flows from the brain through the nerves into the muscles where it's turned into motion. And he devised a series of grisly experiments to prove it. Now, he first prepared a frog. He writes, the frog is skinned and disemboweled, only their lower limbs are left joined together, containing just the crural nerves. Well, I've left my frog mostly intact, but I've exposed the nerves that connect to the frog's legs. Then he used Hawksby's electrical machine to generate electrostatic charge that would accumulate and travel along this arm and out through this copper wire. Then he connected the charge-carrying wire to the frog and another to the nerve just above the leg. Let's see what happens. Oh, and the frog's leg twitches just as he makes contact. There we go. Now, for Galvani, what was going on there was that there's a strange, special kind of entity in the, in the animal muscle, which he calls animal electricity. It's not like any other electricity. It's intrinsic to living beings. But for Volta, animal electricity smacked of superstition and magic. It had no place in rational and enlightened science. Volta saw the experiment completely differently to Galvani. He believed it revealed something totally new. For him, the legs weren't jumping as a result of the release of animal electricity from within them, but because of the artificial electricity from outside. The legs were merely the indicator. They were only twitching because of the electricity from the Hawksby machine. Back in Bologna, Galvani reacted furiously to Volta's ideas. He believed Volta had crossed a fundamental line from electrical experiment into God's realm. And that was tantamount to heresy. To have a kind of spirit like electricity, to have that produced artificially, and to say that that spirit, that living force, that agency, was the same as something produced by God, that God had put into a living human body or a frog's body, that seemed sacrilegious to them because it was eliminating this boundary between God's realm of the divine and the mundane realm of the material. Spurred on by his religious indignation, Galvani announced a new series of experimental results which would prove that Volta was wrong. During one of his experiments, he hung his frogs on an iron wire and saw something totally unexpected. If he connected a copper wire to the wire the frog was hanging from and then touched the other end of the copper to the nerve, it seemed to him that he could make the frog's leg twitch without any electricity at all. Calvani came to the conclusion that it must have been something uh, inside the frogs, uh, even if dead, that continued for a while after death to produce some kind of electricity and the metal wires were somehow releasing that electricity. Over the next months, Galvani's experiments focused on isolating this animal electricity using combinations of frog and metal, Leiden jars and electrical machines. For Galvani, 
These experiments were proof that the electricity was originating within the frog itself. The frog's muscles were Leiden jars, storing up the electrical fluid and then releasing it in a burst. On the 30th of October, 1786, he published his findings in a book, De Animali Electricitati, of animal electricity. Galvani was so confident of his ideas, he even sent a copy of his book to Volta. But Volta just couldn't stomach Galvani's idea of animal electricity. He thought the electricity just had to come from somewhere else. But where? In the 1790s, here at the University of Pavia, almost certainly in this lecture theatre, which still bears his name, Volta began his search for the new source of electricity. His suspicions focused on the metals that Galvani had used to make his frog's legs twitch. His curiosity had been piqued by an odd phenomenon that he'd come across, how combinations of metals tasted. He found that if he took two different metal coins and placed them on the tip of his tongue and then placed a silver spoon on top of both, he got a kind of tingling sensation, rather like the tingling you'd get from the discharge of a Leiden jar. Volta concluded that he could taste electricity and that it must be coming from the contact between the different metals in the coins and spoon. His theory flew in the face of Galvani's. The frog's leg twitched not because of its own animal electricity, but because it was reacting to the electricity from the metals. But the electricity his coins generated was incredibly weak. How could he make it stronger? Then an idea came to him as he revisited the scientific papers from the great British scientist Henry Cavendish, and in particular, his famous work on the electric torpedo fish. He went back and took a closer look at the torpedo fish, and in particular, the repeating pattern of chambers in its back. He wondered whether it was this repeating pattern that held the key to its powerful electric shock. Perhaps each chamber was like his coins and spoon, each generating a tiny amount of electricity. And perhaps the fish's powerful shock results from the pattern of chambers repeating over and over again. With growing confidence in his new ideas, Volta decided to fight back by building his own artificial version of the torpedo fish. So, he copied the torpedo fish by repeating its pattern, but using metal. Here's what he did. He took a copper metal plate and then placed above it a piece of card soaked in dilute acid. Then above that, he took another metal and placed it on top. What he had here was exactly the same thing as Galvani's two wires. But now, Volta repeated the process. What he was doing here was building a pile of metal. In fact, his invention became known as the pile. But it's what it could do that was the really incredible revelation. Volta then tried his pile out on himself by getting two wires and attaching them to each end of the pile and bringing the other ends to touch his tongue. He could actually taste the electricity. This time it was more powerful than normal and it was constant. He'd created the first battery. The machine was no longer an electrical and mechanical machine. It was just a purely electrical machine. And so he proved that a machine imitating the fish could work, that uh, what he called the metal or contact electricity of different metals could work. 
and that he regarded as uh, his final winning move in the controversy with Galvani. What Volta's pile showed was that you could develop all the phenomena of animal electricity without any animals being present. So from the voltaic point of view, it seemed as if Galvani was wrong. There's nothing special about the electricity in animals. It's electricity, and it can be completely mimicked by this artificial pile. But the biggest surprise for Volta was that the electricity it generated was continuous. In fact, it poured out like water in a stream. And just as in a stream where the measure of the amount of water flowing is called a current, so the electricity flowing out of the pile became known as an electrical current. Two hundred years after Volta, we finally understand what electricity actually is. The atoms in metals, like all atoms, have electrically charged electrons surrounding a nucleus. But in metals, the atoms share their outer electrons with each other in a unique way, which means they can move from one atom to the next. If those electrons move in the same direction at the same time, the cumulative effect is a movement of electric charge. This flow of electrons is what we call an electric current. Within weeks of Volta publishing details of his pile, scientists were discovering something incredible about what it could do. Its effect on ordinary water was completely unexpected. The constant stream of electric charge into the water was ripping it up into its constituent parts, the gases, oxygen and hydrogen. Electricity was heralding the dawn of a new age, a new age where electricity ceased being a mere curiosity and started being genuinely useful. With constant flowing current electricity, new chemical elements could be isolated with ease. And this laid the foundations for chemistry, physics and modern industry. Volta's pile changed everything. The pile made Volta an international celebrity, fated by the powerful and the rich. In recognition, a fundamental measure of electricity was named in his honour, the Volt. But his scientific adversary didn't fare quite so well. Luigi Alisio Galvani died on the 4th of December 1798, depressed and in poverty. For me, though, it's not the invention of the battery that marks the crucial turning point in the story of electricity. It's what happened next. It took place in London's Royal Institution. It was a moment that marked the end of one era and the beginning of another. It was overseen by Humphrey Davy, the first of a new generation of electricians, young, confident and fascinated by the possibilities of continuous electrical current. So in 1808, he built the world's largest battery. It filled an entire room underneath the Royal Institution. It had over 800 individual voltaic piles attached together. It must have hissed and breathed sulfurous fumes. In a darkened room lit by centuries-old technology, candles and oil lamps, Davy connected his battery to two carbon filaments and brought the tips together. 
the continuous flow of electricity from the battery through the filaments leapt across the gap, giving rise to a constant and blindingly bright spark. Out of the darkness came the light. Davy's arc light truly symbolizes the end of one era and the beginning of our era, the era of electricity. But there's a truly grisly coda to this story. In 1803, Galvani's nephew, one Giovanni Aldini came to London with a terrifying new experiment. A convicted murderer called George Forster had just been hanged in Newgate. And when the body was cut down from the gallows, it was brought directly to the lecture theatre where Aldini started his macabre work. Using a voltaic pile, he began to apply an electric current to the dead man's body. Then, Aldini put one electrical conductor in the dead man's anus and the other at the top of his spine. Forster's limp, dead body sat bolt upright and his spine arched and twisted. For a moment, it seemed as though the dead body had been brought back to life. It appeared as though electricity might have the power of resurrection. And this made a profound impact on a young writer called Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley wrote one of the most powerful and enduring stories ever. Based partly here on Lake Como, Frankenstein tells the story of a scientist, a galvanist, probably based on Aldini, who brings a monster to life using electricity and then, disgusted by his own arrogance, he abandons his creation. Just like Davy's arc lamp, this book symbolises changing times, the end of the era of miracles and romance and the beginning of the era of rationality, industry and science. And it's that new age we explore in the next programme. Because at the start of the 19th century, scientists realised that electricity was intimately connected with another of nature's mysterious forces, magnetism. And that realisation would completely transform our world. Electricity is one of nature's greatest forces. And by the middle of the 20th century, we'd harnessed it to light and power our modern world. Hundreds of years of scientific discoveries and inventions brought us here. But it would take the eccentric genius of one man to unlock the full potential of electrical power. In the winter of 1943, Nikola Tesla looked out across the Manhattan skyline for the very last time. Tesla had been born into a world powered by steam and lit by gas. But before his eyes, he saw a new world, a world transformed, a world powered by electricity, his world. Frail, lonely, and still mourning the death of one of his beloved pigeons, this extraordinary and eccentric genius knew that his life's work was done, and he lay back on his bed to die. It will be three days before anyone found his body.
Just over 200 years ago, early scientists discovered electricity could be much more than simply a static charge. It could be made to flow in a continuous current. But they were about to discover something profound, that electricity is connected to magnetism. Harnessing the link between magnetism and electricity would completely transform the world and allow us to generate seemingly limitless amounts of electrical power. This is the story of how scientists and engineers unlocked the nature of electricity and then used it in an extraordinary century of innovation and invention. But not before one of the most shocking engineering rivalries in history was finally laid to rest. Our story begins in London at the beginning of the 19th century with a young man who would further our understanding of electricity as much as any other. On the 29th of February, 1812, a 20-year-old self-educated bookbinder called Michael Faraday came here to the Royal Institution of Great Britain. He was surrounded by the great and the good of the academic world. And he was about to listen to one of the greatest scientific minds of the age. Faraday, the son of a blacksmith, had finished his formal education when he was just 12 years old. He would never get to university. But he wasn't finished with learning, as he was fascinated by science. Faraday worked long and hard during the day, binding books. But in the evenings, he would read whatever scientific literature he could lay his hands on. He loved learning new things about the world, and he had this constant desire, this passion, to understand why things were the way they were. Reading scientific papers was one thing. But to really satisfy his craving for knowledge, Faraday was desperate to see the experiments themselves. And he eventually got his chance when he was given a ticket to attend one of the last lectures of England's greatest chemist of the time, Sir Humphrey Davy. It was to change young Faraday's life forever. After watching Davy, awe-inspired and full of ideas, Faraday knew what he wanted to do with his life. He was determined to dedicate himself to furthering science. And that's just what he did. Within a year, Davy had appointed him as an assistant at the Royal Institution. With Davy as his patron and, well, his boss, Faraday studied all manner of chemistry. But what would inspire his greatest breakthroughs were the invisible forces of electricity and magnetism. In 1820, both were being studied by a Danish scientist, Hans Christian Ørsted, who'd made an extraordinary discovery. He passed an electric current through a copper rod and brought it close to a magnetic compass needle and saw that it made the needle rotate. To Ørsted, it was remarkable. He'd shown, for the first time, that an electric current can create a magnetic force. He'd bound electricity and magnetism together. Today, we call it electromagnetism, and it's one of the fundamental forces of nature. Ursa's discovery sparks off a whole new spate of inventive activity around and about the fields of 
electricity. You can almost see electrical experimenters vying, competing with each other to find new links between electricity and the other powers of nature. At the Royal Institution, Faraday set about recreating Ersted's work, which would mark his first steps to fame and fortune. And through his rigorous research, he concluded that there must be a flow of forces acting between the wire and the compass needle. The device he designed to demonstrate it would change the course of history. Faraday created a circuit using a battery like this, a pair of wires and a mercury bath. Now the circuit carries on through these copper posts and this wire hangs freely, it dangles into the mercury. Now because mercury is such a good conductor, it completes the circuit. When the current runs through the circuit, it generates a circular magnetic force field around the wire. Now this interacts with the magnetism from a permanent magnet that Faraday had placed in the middle of the mercury. Together they force the wire to move. Faraday had proved that this invisible force really does exist and he could see its effect. Circular motion. This beautiful device was the first to convert electric current into continuous motion. Basically, it's the earliest ever electric motor. But Faraday was about to take this experiment further. One of the lasting effects of Faraday's discovery of electromagnetic rotations in 1821 was that it showed that there was a relationship of some sort between electricity, magnetism and motion. Faraday explored this relationship in detail and set himself an even more difficult challenge. To use magnetism and motion to make electricity. Eventually his obsession, hard work and determination paid off. The breakthrough came on the 17th of October, 1831, when Faraday took a magnet like this and moved it in and out of a coil of wire. He was able to detect a tiny electric current in the coil, moving one way and then the other. Faraday knew he was onto something, a few days later, instead of moving the magnet through the conducting wire coil, he set up the equivalent experiment by moving a conducting copper plate through the magnetic field. He didn't know it at the time, but as his spinning disc cut through this magnetic field, billions of negatively charged electrons were deflected from their original circular course and began to drift towards the edge. A negative charge built up at the outer edge of the disc, leaving a positive charge at the center. And once the disc was connected to wires, the electrons flowed in a steady stream. Faraday had generated a continuous flow of electric current. Unlike a battery, his current flowed for as long as his copper disc was spun. He'd created electrical power directly from mechanical power. Although Faraday's discovery of induction was extraordinarily important in its own right and had profound effects uh, for the understanding of electricity and technology uh, for the rest of the 19th century, for Faraday, what it did was to open up a decade of powerful research uh, because it gave him the clue about how he should pursue his research. While Faraday continued his work, trying to understand the very nature of electricity, inventors from across Europe were less interested in the science and more interested in how electricity could make them money. What's actually quite remarkable, you know, certainly from a contemporary perspective, is that by and large, nobody really seems to care very much what electricity is. 
you don't have great theoretical debates as to whether it's a force or a fluid or a principle or a power. What they're really interested in is what electricity can do. Faraday, living in a world of steam power, was informing the scientific community about the nature of electricity. But at the same time, another breakthrough in how we could actually use it had been made. This will be the first device that really brought electricity out of the laboratory and into the hands of ordinary people. The telegraph. The key to understanding the telegraph is understanding a special kind of magnet, an electromagnet. Basically, a magnet created by an electric current. The first electromagnets were developed independently by William Sturgeon in Britain and Joseph Henry in America. And just as Faraday had discovered that by coiling his wire, he could increase the current in it produced by the moving magnet, so Henry and Sturgeon discovered that by adding more coils in their current carrying wires, they could make a more concentrated magnetic field. Basically, the more coils, the more turns, the stronger the magnet. So if I pass a current through this electromagnet, you can actually see the effects of the magnetic field. This is the standard school experiment of sprinkling iron filings on top of the magnet. If I give it a tap, see the iron filings follow the contours of the field. This allows us to visualise the effects of magnetism. To make an electromagnet even stronger, Henry and Sturgeon discovered that they could place certain kinds of metal inside the electromagnetic coil. The reason iron is so effective is fascinating because you can think of it as being made up of lots of tiny magnets all pointing in random directions. At the moment, this is not a magnet. The tiny magnets inside are aligned similarly to these compass needles. If you see, they're all pointing in different directions. But when you apply a magnetic field, they all align together. They all combine these magnets and cumulatively they add to the strength of the electromagnet. So what Henry and Sturgeon did was place two electromagnetic coils on each arm of their horseshoe to create something that was many, many times more powerful. And we can see the power of this horseshoe electromagnet. If I turn it on and use something slightly bigger than iron filings, these small pieces of iron, look at the strength of the magnetic field holding them in place. What's important to remember, of course, is that this electromagnet only works all the time there's a current passing through it. As soon as I turn off the current, the magnetism disappears. Early experimenters showed off this power by lifting metal weights. Henry even made one big enough to lift a tonne and a half of metal. Impressive, but not world-changing. But place that magnet much further away, at the end of a wire, and suddenly you can make something happen at your command, in an instant. This ability to control a magnet at a distance is one of the most useful things we've ever discovered. If electricity can be made visible a long way away from the original source of power, then you've got a source of instantaneous communication. By the middle of the 1840s, Samuel Morse had developed a messaging system based on how long an electrical circuit was switched on or off. A long pulse of current for a dash, a short burst for a dot. This allowed messages to be sent and received by using a simple code. Contemporary early Victorian commentators you know, reflect on the fact that electricity and the telegraph you know, is literally making their world a smaller place. You very often get a sort of rhetoric throughout the 19th century when people are talking about the telegraph, 
you know, about how you know, more communication, more understanding will render war obsolete because we'll all understand each other better. I mean, retrospectively, it seems hopelessly utopian. By the 1850s, Europe and America were crisscrossed with land-based telegraph wires. But the dream of instant global communication was frustratingly out of reach. This was because there was still no cable capable of carrying messages between two of the greatest powers on Earth, Britain and America. Many experts were convinced that a working Atlantic cable was impossible. But those who disagreed knew that if they could solve this problem, it could make them serious money. And in the 1850s, American businessmen and British engineers joined forces to prove this could be done. Attempt after attempt ended in disaster. The heavy cables kept snapping in heavy seas and storms. Finally, on the 29th of July, 1858, two parts of a cable were spliced together in mid-Atlantic. You see, a single cable was simply too big to have been carried by one ship. Then one end was taken to Newfoundland and the other end to Southwest Ireland. Six days later, the first direct link between the two most powerful nations in the world was in place. The project was hailed a huge success and a formal message of congratulations was sent from Queen Victoria to President Buchanan. But before the celebrations were over, things started to go very wrong. This is Chief Engineer Bright's original notebook. You can see here Queen Victoria's original message. Now, it's only 98 words long, but it took 16 hours to transmit. The telegraph operators on the other side found it very hard to decipher the message. The electrical signals that they were receiving were, were blurred and distorted, and they kept asking for words to be repeated over and over again. So you can see here, repeat after sending, waiting to receive, no signals. Clearly, transmitting across the Atlantic wasn't going to be as straightforward as people had hoped. Over the next few days, several hundred messages were exchanged. But those arriving in Newfoundland became almost impossible to decipher. Just a jumbled mess of dots and dashes. There was a serious problem with the cable, and it was getting worse. Well, the 1858 cable was never fully repaired. And the end finally came when British engineer Wildman Whitehouse mistakenly believed that by increasing the signal voltage, he could force the messages through to Newfoundland. The cable simply stopped working altogether. At the time, increasing the voltage by using more powerful batteries made sense. Most experts believed electric current flowed through a cable like a fluid in a pipe. Increasing the voltage was the equivalent of increasing the pressure in the system, forcing the current through to the other end. But the telegraph was actually carrying pulses or ripples of current along the cable, not a continuous stream. And over long distances, these pulses were becoming distorted, making it difficult to tell what was a short dot and which was a longer dash. By studying the effectiveness of underwater cabling, scientists were beginning to understand that electric current didn't always flow like water, but was also creating invisible electromagnetic waves or ripples. And it's this breakthrough that would lead to a new branch of research into the electromagnetic spectrum and solve the problems of the Atlantic Telegraph. In effect, the transatlantic cable was a giant, ambitious, hugely expensive experiment. The failure of science to keep pace with technology had been exposed. And a new, more theoretical, 
and for me, much more exciting approach to understanding electricity began to unfold. Armed with this new understanding of how electric pulses actually moved along the cable, improvements were made to its composition, design and how it was laid. It would take another eight years of scientists and engineers working together before a working cable was finally put in place. And on Friday, the 27th of July, 1866, a message was sent from Ireland to Newfoundland, clear and crisp. A treaty of peace has been signed between Austria and Prussia. At last, the dream of instant transatlantic communication had become a reality. The success of the 1866 cable makes the world a smaller place yet again. The change from the world in where it took days or weeks or months for information to travel you know, to a world in which information took seconds or minutes to travel you know, is far more profound, I think, than anything that's taken place during my lifetime. The invention of the telegraph changed ordinary people's lives. But it would be the breakthroughs in how we used continuously flowing electric current that would have an even greater impact. Because inventors were developing a new way of using electricity. To make something every person in the world would want. Electric light. Until the 19th century, we only knew of one way to make our own light. Burn things. And by the middle of the 19th century, we'd perfected a very effective way of lighting our homes using gas. A typical British home in the 1860s would have been lit like this. Highly flammable gas would have been pumped directly into people's houses through a network of pipes. But these gas lamps were too dull for large outdoor areas. So railway stations and streets began to be lit from a more powerful source, electric arc lights. The first arc lights were demonstrated by Michael Faraday's mentor, Sir Humphrey Davy, at the Royal Institution as early as 1808. And they worked by passing a continuous spark of electricity across two carbon rods. But their intense white glow was just too bright for people's homes. For an electric light to compete with gas, it would need to be subdivided into many smaller, less powerful and more gentle lamps. Whoever succeeded in bringing electric light to every home in the land was guaranteed fame and fortune. And by the early 1880s, the most famous, most prodigious, most fiercely competitive inventor in the world had taken on the challenge. The American Thomas Elva Edison. For Edison, invention was a passion. It's what he loved doing. He loved being in the laboratory. The first thing that drove that passion is that it was a lot of fun for Edison. I think that was the thing that, that he found most exciting, is that this was something he did well, and it allowed all of his creativity to come to the fore. Edison is Mr. Electrical Invention. He's the man that they trust. He's the man that they think can do anything. He's also the man who has his carefully cultivated connections with entrepreneurs, with people who are willing to put, you know, put their cash where Edison's mouth is, so to speak, and back him in this sort of venture. 
For Edison, the money was probably the least important reason. For Edison, the money was important for one reason, to allow him to do the next project. Edison had assembled a group of young and talented engineers at a cutting-edge laboratory in New Jersey, 26 miles from Manhattan. Menlo Park would become the world's first research and development facility, allowing Edison's team to invent on an industrial scale. They worked incredible hours. You know, one of them talked about how he ever, hardly ever saw his children because he was in the lab all the time. But they knew they were in the midst of something really important, right? That if Edison succeeded, right, if they succeeded with Edison, that their futures were secure. Edison's dream was to bring electric light to every home in the land. And with his team of engineers behind him and the vision of an electric future ahead, he launched his campaign. The race to bring electric light to the world was to play out in the great cities of the time. New York, Paris, London. Edison's Menlo Park team set about developing a totally different form of electric lamp, the incandescent light bulb. In fact, Edison's light bulb design wasn't all that new or unique. French, Russian, Belgian and British inventors had been perfecting similar bulbs for over 40 years. And one of them, an Englishman, Joseph Swan, had been developing his own version of an incandescent lamp. Both Swan and Edison's light bulbs work by passing an electric current through a filament. Now, a filament is a material in which the electric current flows through with more difficulty than it does through the copper wire in the rest of the circuit. And it relies on the idea of resistance. Now, inside this jar, I have a filament made out of ordinary pencil lead. And we can see what happens as I pass a current through it. Down at the atomic scale, the atoms in the filament impede the flow of electricity. So it takes more energy to force it through. And this energy is deposited in the filament as heat. Now, as it heats up, its resistance goes up, which again raises its temperature until it glows white hot. Now, one of the first materials Edison used for his filaments was platinum. With its relatively high melting point, platinum could be heated to a white hot temperature without melting. It could also be stretched into thin strands, and the thinner the strand, the more resistance it offered to the current passing through it. But platinum was expensive and didn't offer enough resistance. The race was on to find a better alternative. And the solution came when the Menlo Park team switched to a method Swan was also developing, using a vacuum to stop cheaper carbon filaments from burning up too quickly. Edison and Swan tested all kinds of different materials for their filaments, everything from raw silk and parchment to cork. Edison even tested his engineer's beard hair. Eventually, he settled on bamboo fibre, while Swan used a treated cotton thread. Edison and Swan's light bulb designs were very similar. Eventually, they came to an agreement and went into partnership to sell light bulbs in the UK. Today, many people still believe that Edison alone invented the light bulb, while Swan has become a footnote in history. But his incandescent bulb was only part of Edison's strategy. He'd also invented an entire electrical system of sockets, cables and meters to go with it. And being a brilliant businessman, he developed a groundbreaking new way of distributing electricity. Edison knew that the key to making money from his system 
was to generate the electricity in a central station and then sell it to as many customers as possible. It seems obvious to us now, but until then, anyone who wanted to use electricity had to have their own noisy generator to make it. Edison's ambition was huge. He wanted to light the fastest growing and most exciting city in the world. New York. In the summer of 1882, Edison stood in a unique position at the center of 19th century science and invention. He'd patented a cutting edge incandescent light bulb. He'd amassed an unprecedented knowledge of electrical engineering. And above all, he'd cultivated a reputation among the American public of being such a genius inventor that journalists hung on his every word and the financial muscle of Wall Street was quick to throw itself behind his new ideas. His vision to electrify Manhattan and then, of course, the rest of the world was seemingly within his grasp. Because Edison and his team were about to launch their most expensive and risky project yet. America's first power station generating continuous direct current. Just before 3 p.m. on the 4th of September 1882, Thomas Edison, surrounded by a gaggle of bankers, dignitaries and reporters, entered J.P. Morgan's building right behind me, flicked one of the Edison patented switches and 100 of his incandescent bulbs began to glow. Turning to a nearby journalist, he said, I have accomplished all that I've promised. Half a mile away on Pearl Street, Edison's new power station, costing half a million dollars and four years of hard work, had sprung into life. The current surged through buried cables, stretching out in each direction. Of course, it might seem obvious to us now, but in New York back in the early 1880s, the idea of burying electric cables underground seemed like an unnecessary expense. This street would have been crisscrossed with hundreds of cables used for telegraphs, telephones and arc street lighting. Looking up, you'd have seen a tangled mass of black spaghetti blocking out the light. Edison knew this dangerous situation had to change. And for him to make as much money as he could, electricity needed rebranding. It had to be considered safe. So Edison is arguing both for the greater safety of his DC low voltage system and for underground lines. He can argue that he has a much safer system than electric arc light for streets, or gas lighting for indoor lighting, right? He doesn't have to worry about fires, doesn't have to worry about electrocution, that all of this is much safer because of the system he's created with this underground system. Burying every cable was not only very expensive, but was a logistical nightmare, because this was one of the busiest square miles in the world. Edison chose this area for a reason. Wall Street, rich, important, influential. Because for Edison's system to make money, all these wealthy customers had to be within a mile of his power station. And this was because Edison calculated the thickest cable he could afford would only carry an adequate amount of his continuous direct current to customers within this range. This was a huge leap forward, because for the first time, dozens of customers could be supplied by just one power station. But there was a big problem. Edison's network could never be economical in lighting America's new suburbs. They just didn't have the concentration of customers needed to make building these expensive power stations worthwhile. Had we stuck with Edison's way of generating and distributing electricity, the world would be a very different place.
we'd have to have power stations scattered around no more than a mile apart, even in the centres of our towns and cities. And it would be extraordinarily expensive to even provide power for smaller communities. But someone who held the answers to these problems was about to enter the story. Someone who would help create the modern world and who'd play an integral part in one of the biggest fallouts in scientific history. His name was Nikola Tesla and he was right under Edison's nose. Nikola Tesla was a Serbian inventor who was born in Croatia and who worked for Edison briefly after arriving in New York at the age of 28. European, introverted, a deep thinker. He was everything Edison wasn't. Edison and Tesla could not be more different in the way that they handled their self-appearance and their, and their manners and the way that they constructed a public image for themselves. Edison could care less about the clothes that he had on, and if he spilled chemicals on his good Sunday suit, then he spilled chemicals on his good Sunday suit. He, he was, a, you know, basically a very, very kind of slovenly guy. Tesla, on the other hand, even as a young man in his mid-20s, is thinking about his appearance, how he comes across to people, so he cares about his clothes, he cares about his manner, indeed he even cares about how his, how his photograph, his portraits are taken, and he always wants to make sure that he has a nice three-quarter profile, so you don't see that the fact that he has a bit of a pointy chin. The life and death of Nikola Tesla is one of the most fascinating yet tragic stories of scientific brilliance, cutthroat business, and shocking public relations stunts. The American public may have been wowed by Edison's new direct current power stations, but Tesla was less impressed. He had a dream electricity could be transmitted across entire cities or even nations and he believed he knew how it could be done by using a different type of electric current. Electrical experts knew that the smaller the current sent down a cable, the smaller the losses in it through resistance, and so the longer the cable could be. Tesla proposed using a method of transmitting electricity where the currents could be lowered without a fall in the amount of electrical power at the other end. It was called alternating current. Alternating current is exactly that. It's an electric current that alternates between moving in one direction, then the opposite direction very quickly, as opposed to a direct current which moves only in one direction. Tesla was interested in alternating current because like other electrical engineers in the late 1880s, he realized that as you raise the voltage of any current that you transmit from point A to point B, it's going to be more efficient to have a higher voltage. And since the amount of electric power in a cable is its voltage multiplied by its current, increasing the voltage meant the current in the cables could be reduced, and so losses due to resistance would be less. However, you don't want very high voltages on the order of, say, 20,000 volts coming into your home. So you need to step down the current that is being transmitted over a distance into your home, and to do that, you need a converter or a transformer. Alternating current allows you to use a transformer to make that switch from the high transmission voltage to the lower voltage that you're going to use at consumption. Perfecting the technology to transmit electricity hundreds of miles from where it was generated would mark a huge step towards the modern world. And a wealthy industrial entrepreneur was already developing the solution. His name was George Westinghouse. Westinghouse believed alternating currents was the future, but it had a big drawback. While it was fine for electric light, Unlike direct current, there was no practical motor that could run on it, and no one believed there ever would be. 
apart from Nikola Tesla. Tesla, as an inventor, liked to say that the first thing you need to do is not to build something, but to imagine it, to think it through, to plan it. And he had what modern-day psychologists would call an eidetic memory. He could basically remember everything that he saw and then visualize it in three dimensions. And they often say that the people that have this skill see it about an arm's length away out here, and they see it in three dimensions in that space. And all of the indications are is, is Tesla had that ability. This is a Tesla egg. It's a replica of the one Tesla used to demonstrate his greatest breakthrough and one of the most important inventions of all time. It showed how rotary movement can be produced directly from an alternating current, crucially one that could be generated thousands of miles away. This was something that had never been done before. When Tesla was working on the alternating current motor, he was thinking big and he was not just tinkering with one little component of the motor and saying, gee, if I can make that a little bit better, it will work out. He's actually thinking about an entire system that involves the generator, the wires to the motor, and the motor itself. He's a complete maverick. He's thinking outside the box. He's doing things very differently than any of his fellow contemporary inventors. Tesla's solution was ingenious. He fed more than one alternating current into his motor and timed them so that they followed in sequence with each other. The first alternating current energized a coil of wire inside the motor, creating an electromagnetic field which attracted the motor's central moving part to it and then faded. The second overlapping current fed the next coil dragging the moving part around further before it faded, and the same for the third coil and the fourth. The result was a revolving magnetic field strong enough to make the motor, or in this case his egg, spin. Tesla designed an entire electrical system around this called polyphase transmission. This meant a noisy and smelly power station generating lots of useful alternating currents could now be situated away from populated areas. And for the first time, you can build large power stations wherever you want, on the edge of town or at a waterfall like Niagara, and you can then distribute the power over long distances and serve all the people in a major city or, or metropolitan center. Tesla's breakthrough was the last piece of the jigsaw, but he still had to convince the world that his solution was better than the direct current method championed by Edison. Edison continued to roll out his direct current system, building power stations across New York State. But then Tesla met George Westinghouse, the man who could make his dreams into a reality. In July 1888, Westinghouse made an offer for Tesla's patents, which has become part of the mystery and folklore surrounding the whole Nikola Tesla story, where it's difficult to separate fact from fiction. Tesla was paid $75,000 for his alternating current patents and offered $2.50 for every horsepower his motors would generate. This should have guaranteed him vast wealth for the rest of his life. But that isn't what happened. It's clear to us now that at the time, the AC system was a much better method of transmitting electric power. And you'd think that with Tesla's breakthroughs, nothing could stand in the way of the success of AC over DC. But one man still believed totally in his direct current inventions. From the filaments of the bulbs to the switches, sockets, and generators. And he wasn't about to waste millions of dollars on changing them. Edison. The battle lines were drawn. 
Westinghouse and Tesla went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Edison for New York's lucrative lighting contracts. Two completely different systems battling it out for one ultimate prize. The chance to light up America and then the world. It will become known as the War of the Currents. Both camps tried to undercut each other on cost, but Edison believed his beloved direct current was better than alternating current because it was safer. Touching an Edison cable with its low voltage was painful but relatively harmless, whereas alternating current cables carried a much higher voltage and touching them could be deadly. So. What Edison was trying to do was to, again, define his DC system, right, as the safe system. It's better than electric street arc lights, it's better than gas, and it's now better than high-voltage AC incandescent lighting, right? It's the system that's safe. You adopt the Edison system, you can be sure it's going to be safe. Edison claimed that AC was a more dangerous type of current than DC, and he highlighted every accident to Westinghouse's workmen and every fire caused by short circuits. It was a potent message, because in the 1880s, many people were still terrified by electricity. It could shock and even kill in an instant, and the reasons why still weren't fully understood. For many, the idea of piping this invisible killer into their homes was utterly ludicrous. So the weapon used in the War of the Currents was fear. And a little-known electrical engineer, Harold P. Brown, was about to take the fight against AC to a whole new level. It was to prove one of the most extreme and negative publicity campaigns in history. Brown had devised a unique and theatrical way of demonstrating the deadly power of AC. And he was eager to share it with the world. So on a warm summer's evening in July 1888, he gathered together 75 of the country's top electrical engineers and reporters to witness a spectacle they would never forget. Brown's plan was extremely macabre. He'd paid a team of street urchins to collect together stray dogs roaming Manhattan. Out on stage, he addressed his audience. I have asked you here, gentlemen, to witness the experimental application of electricity to a number of brutes. His demonstration involved electrocuting the dogs with DC and AC power in an attempt to show that AC current killed them more quickly. And it wasn't just dogs. Brown went on to make public spectacles of killing a calf and even a horse. And he moved from dogs to larger animals for a reason. He wanted to show that the AC form of electricity was so dangerous it could kill any large mammal, including humans. Brown's animal experiments had persuaded American politicians the most humane method of executing condemned criminals should be with alternating current generated by Westinghouse machines. Edison's lawyers even suggested a new term to describe being electrocuted in this way. To be Westinghoused. And at precisely 6.32, on the morning of the 6th of August, 1890, a 45-year-old man, William Kemmler, was strapped to a wooden chair and two soaking wet electrodes were carefully attached to him. 
and as 26 officials and doctors looked on from an adjoining room, Kemler said goodbye to the prison chaplain and waited. The execution of William Kemler marked the lowest point in the War of the Current, but it wouldn't quite mark the end because Nikola Tesla was about to do something that had never been seen before. Something so wondrous and daring that it would live on forever in the memories of those who saw it. Tesla had been developing a method of generating very high frequency alternating currents. And on May 21st, 1891, at a meeting of top electrical engineers, he demonstrated it. In an almost magical display of awesome power and wonder, and without wearing any safety chainmail or mask, tens of thousands of volts produced by a Tesla coil, passed across his body and through the end of a lamp that he was holding. Tesla's alternating current was at such a high frequency that it passed through his body without causing serious harm or even pain. His demonstrations showed that if handled correctly, Alternating current at extremely high voltages could be safe. The war of the currents had been won by Westinghouse and Tesla. In 1896, a new power station was completed at Niagara Falls using Westinghouse AC generators to produce Tesla's polyphase current. Finally, huge amounts of power could be transmitted from the falls to nearby Buffalo. And then, a few years later, the Niagara plant was providing power to New York City itself. And today, almost all of the electricity generated in the world is done so using Tesla's system. But Tesla's story doesn't end in fame and fortune. Although he went on to make significant contributions to many other areas of science and invention, to save George Westinghouse from ruin after a stock market crash, he gave up his claim to the royalties from his polyphase inventions. Nikola Tesla was a uniquely talented man, and we owe him so much. But he was also hugely complicated, and sadly, later in life, he became more and more troubled. He was fixated with the number three, counting it out loud as he walked. And he developed strange phobias with germs and with women wearing pearl jewellery. In many ways, his brilliant mind simply spun out of control. As Tesla's life unravelled, he withdrew from people and found emotional comfort elsewhere. He became obsessed with pigeons and was regularly seen feeding them here in Bryant Park in the centre of Manhattan. He even fell in love with one particularly unusual white bird. And when it died, he was left heartbroken. As an old man, Tesla was left almost bankrupt and alone, living as a semi-recluse in this hotel. His last years were spent here in room 3327 of the New Yorker Hotel, sad, confused, destitute. Edison went on to become an American hero and his company would form part of General Electric. Even today, 
one of the world's biggest multinational corporations. In January 1943, the story of Nikola Tesla was coming to an end. But looking out across the Manhattan skyline for the very last time, he saw a sky lit up with twinkling lights and a million lives transformed by his genius. The ability to generate and transmit electricity and the invention of machines to use it have changed our world in ways we couldn't possibly have imagined. We can now generate billions of watts of electricity every second, every hour, every day. And whether we do it using coal, gas or nuclear fission, Power stations all rely on the principles discovered and developed by Michael Faraday, Nikola Tesla, and all the other early electrical engineers from an amazing age of invention. We now take electricity for granted and have forgotten how magical and mysterious a force it once was. But there's something we should never forget. Today, Without it, the modern world would collapse around us and our lives would be very, very different. In the next episode, we tell of the electrical revelations that led to a revolution in our understanding of this amazing force. On the 14th of August, 1894, an excited crowd gathered outside Oxford's Natural History Museum. This huge Gothic building was hosting the annual meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Over 2,000 tickets had been sold in advance and the museum was already packed, waiting for the next talk to be given by Professor Oliver Lodge. His name might not be familiar to us now, but his discoveries should have made him as famous as some of the other great electrical pioneers of history. People like Benjamin Franklin, Alessandro Volta, or even the great Michael Faraday. Quite unwittingly, he would set in motion a series of events that would revolutionize the Victorian world of brass and telegraph wire. This lecture would mark the birth of the modern electrical world, a world dominated by silicon and mass wireless communication. In this programme, we discover how electricity connected the world together through broadcasting and computer networks, and how we finally learnt to unravel and exploit electricity at an atomic level. After centuries of man's experiments with electricity, a new age of real understanding was now dawning. tubes are not plugged in to any power source, but they still light up. It's electricity's invisible effect, an effect not just confined to the wires it flows through. In the middle of the 19th century, a great theory was proposed to explain how this could be. The theory says that surrounding any electric charge and there's a lot of electricity flowing above my head, is a force field. These fluorescent tubes 
are lit purely because they're under the influence of the force field from the power cables above. The theory that a flow of electricity could in some way create an invisible force field was originally proposed by Michael Faraday, but it would take a brilliant young Scotsman called James Clark Maxwell who would prove Faraday correct. And not through experimentation, but through mathematics. This was all a far cry from the typical 19th century way of understanding how the world works, which was essentially to see it as a physical machine. Before Maxwell, scientists had often built strange machines or devised wondrous experiments to create and measure electricity. But Maxwell was different. He was interested in the numbers. And his new theory not only revealed electricity's invisible force field, but how it could be manipulated. It would prove to be one of the most important scientific discoveries of all time. Maxwell was a mathematician and a great one. And he saw electricity and magnetism in an entirely new way. He expressed it all in terms of very compact mathematical equations. And the most important thing is that in Maxwell's equations is an understanding of electricity and magnetism as something linked and as something that can occur in waves. Maxwell's calculations showed how these fields could be disturbed, rather like touching the surface of water with your finger. Changing the direction of the electric current would create a ripple or wave through these electric and magnetic fields. And constantly changing the direction of the flow of the current forwards and backwards, like an alternating current, would produce a whole series of waves waves that would carry energy. Maxwell's maths was telling him that changing electric currents would be constantly sending out great waves of energy into their surroundings, waves that would carry on forever unless something absorbed them. Maxwell's maths was so advanced and complicated that only a handful of people understood it at the time. And although his work was still only a theory, it inspired a young German physicist called Heinrich Hertz. Hertz decided to dedicate himself to designing an experiment to prove that Maxwell's waves really existed. And here it is. This is Hertz's original apparatus, and its beauty is in its sheer simplicity. He generates an alternating current that runs along these metal rods with a spark that jumps across the gap between these two spheres. Now, if Maxwell was right, then this alternating current should generate an invisible electromagnetic wave that spreads out into the surroundings. If you place a wire in the path of that wave, then at the wire, there should be a changing electromagnetic field, which should induce an electric current in the wire. So what Hertz did was build this ring of wire, his receiver, that he could carry around in different positions in the room to see if he could detect the presence of the wave. And the way he did that was leave a very tiny gap in the wire across which a spark would jump if a current runs through the ring. Now, because the current is so weak, that spark is very, very faint. And Hertz spent pretty much most of 1887 in a darkened room staring intensely through a lens to see if he could detect the presence of this faint spark. But Hertz wasn't alone in trying to create Maxwell's waves. Back in England, 
A young physics professor called Oliver Lodge had been fascinated by the topic for years, but hadn't had the time to design any experiments to try to discover them. Then, one day in early 1888, while setting up an experiment on lightning protection, he noticed something unusual. Lodge noticed that when he set up his equipment and sent an alternating current around the wires, he could see glowing patches between the wires. And with a bit of tweaking, he saw these glowing patches formed a pattern. The blue glow and electrical sparks occurred in distinct patches evenly spaced along the wires. He realised they were the peaks and troughs of a wave, an invisible electromagnetic wave. Lodge had proved that Maxwell was right. Finally, by accident, Lodge had created Maxwell's electromagnetic waves around the wires. The big question had been answered. Filled with excitement at his discovery, Lodge prepared to announce it to the world at that summer's annual scientific meeting run by the British Association. Before it, though, he decided to go on holiday. His timing couldn't have been worse, because back in Germany, and at exactly the same time, Heinrich Hertz was also testing Maxwell's theories. Eventually, Hertz found what he was looking for, a minute spark. And as he carried his receiver around to different positions in the room, he was able to map out the shape of the waves being produced by his apparatus. And he checked each of Maxwell's calculations carefully and tested them experimentally. It was a tour de force of experimental science. Back in Britain, as the crowds gathered for the British Association meeting, Oliver Lodge returned from holiday, relaxed and full of anticipation. This, Lodge thought, would be his moment of triumph, when he could announce his discovery of Maxwell's waves. His great friend, the mathematician Fitzgerald, was due to give the opening address in the meeting. But in it, he proclaimed that Heinrich Hertz had just published astounding results. He had detected Maxwell's waves travelling through space. We have snatched the thunderbolt from Jove himself and enslaved the all-pervading ether, he announced. Well, I can only imagine how Lodge must have felt having his thunder stolen. Professor Oliver Lodge had lost his moment of triumph, pipped at the post by Heinrich Hertz. Hertz's spectacular demonstration of electromagnetic waves, what we now call radio waves, even though he didn't know it at the time, is going to lead to a, a whole revolution in communications over the next century. Maxwell's theory had shown how electric charges could create a force field around them, and that waves could spread through these fields like ripples on a pond. And Hertz had built a device that could actually create and detect the waves as they passed through the air. But almost immediately, there would be another revelation in our understanding of electricity. A revelation that would once again involve Professor Oliver Lodge, and once again, his thunder would be stolen. The story starts in Oxford in the summer of 1894. Hertz had died suddenly earlier that year, and so Lodge prepared a memorial lecture with a demonstration that would bring the idea of waves to a wider audience. Lodge had worked on his lecture. He'd researched better ways of detecting the waves, and he'd borrowed new apparatus from friends. 
he'd made some significant advances in the technology designed to detect the waves. This bit of apparatus generates an alternating current and a spark across this gap. The alternating current sends out an electromagnetic wave, just as Maxwell predicted, that is picked up by the receiver. It sets off a very weak electric current through these two antennae. Now, this is what Hertz had done. Lodge's improvement on this was to set up this tube full of iron filings. The weak electric current passes through the filings, forcing them to clump together. And when they do, they close a second electric circuit and set off the bell. So if I push the button on this end, it sets off the bell at the receiver. And it's doing that with no connections between the two. It's like magic. You've got to imagine a packed house, lots of people in the audience, and what they suddenly see is, as if by magic, a bell ringing. It's quite incredible. It might not have been the most dramatic demonstration the audience had ever seen, but it certainly still created a sensation among the crowd. Lodge's apparatus, laid out like this, no longer looked like a scientific experiment. In fact, it looked remarkably like those telegraph machines that had revolutionized communication, but without those long cables stretching between the sending and receiving stations. To the more worldly and savvy members of the audience, this was clearly more than showing the maestro Maxwell was right. This was a revolutionary new form of communication. Lodge published his lecture notes on how electromagnetic waves could be sent and received using his new improvements. All around the world, inventors, amateur enthusiasts and scientists read Lodge's reports with excitement and began experimenting with Hertzian waves. Two utterly different characters were to be inspired by it. Both would bring improvements to the wireless telegraph, and both will be remembered for their contribution to science far more than Oliver Lodge. The first was Guglielmo Marconi. Marconi was a very intelligent, astute, and a very charming individual. He definitely had the Italian-Irish charm. He could apply this to almost anyone, from sort of young ladies to world-renowned scientists. Marconi was no scientist, but he read all he could of other people's work in order to put together his own wireless telegraph system. And it's possible that because he was brought up in Bologna and it was fairly close to the Italian coast, that he saw the potential of wireless communications in relation to maritime usage fairly early on. Then, aged only 22, he came to London with his Irish mother to market it. The other person inspired by Lodge's lecture was a teacher at the Presidency College in Calcutta called Jagadish Chandra Bose. Despite degrees from London and Cambridge, the appointment of an Indian as a scientist in Calcutta had been a battle against racial prejudice. Indians, it was said, didn't have the requisite temperament for exact science. Well, Bose was determined to prove this wrong, and here in the archives we can see just how fast he set to work. This is a report of the 66th meeting of the British Association in Liverpool, September 1896, and here is Bose, the first Indian ever to present at the Association meeting talking about his work and demonstrating his apparatus. He built and improved on the detector that Lodge described. Because in the hot, sticky Indian climate, he'd found that the metal filings inside the tube that, that Lodge used to, de to detect the waves became rusty and stuck together. So Bose had to build a more practical detector using a coiled wire instead. His work was described as a sensation. 
The detector was extremely reliable and could work on board ships, so it had great potential for the vast British naval fleet. Britain was the centre of a vast telecommunications network which stretched almost around the world, which was used to support a, an equally vast maritime network of merchant and naval vessels which were used to support the British Empire. But Bose, a pure scientist, wasn't interested in the commercial potential of wireless signals, unlike Marconi. This was a sort of a new cutting-edge field, but Marconi wasn't a trained scientist, so he did come at things in a fairly different way, which is may, may have been why he progressed so quickly in the first place. And he was very good at forming connections with the people that he needed to form connections with to enable his work to be done. Marconi used his connections to go straight to the only place that had the resources to help him. The British Post Office was a hugely powerful institution. When Marconi first arrived in London in 1896, these buildings were newly completed and already heaving with business from the Empire's postal and telegraphy services. Marconi had brought his telegraph system with him from Italy, claiming it could send wireless signals over unheard of distances. And the post office engineer in chief, William Priest, immediately saw the technology's potential. So Priest offered Marconi the great financial and engineering resources of the post office, and they started work up on the roof. The old headquarters of the post office were right there. And between this roof and that one, Marconi and the post office engineers would practice sending and receiving electromagnetic waves. The engineers helped him improve his apparatus, and then Priest and Marconi together demonstrated it to influential people in government and the Navy. What Priest didn't realise was that even as he was proudly announcing Marconi's successful partnership with the post office, Marconi was making plans behind the scenes. He'd applied for a British patent on the whole field of wireless telegraphy and was planning on setting up his own company. When the patent was granted, all hell broke loose in the scientific community. That patent was itself revolutionary. You see, patents could only be taken out on things that weren't public knowledge. But Marconi famously had hidden his equipment in a secret box. And here it is. When his patent was finally granted, Marconi ceremoniously opened the box. Everyone was keen to see what inventions lay within. Batteries forming a circuit, iron filings in the tube to complete the circuit to ring the bell on top. Nothing they hadn't seen before. And yet Marconi had patented the lot. The reason why Marconi is famous is not because of that invention. He doesn't invent radio. Right? But he improves it and turns it into a system. Lodge doesn't do that. And that's why we remember Marconi, and that's why we don't remember Lodge. The scientific world was up in arms. He was this young man who knew very little about the science behind his equipment, about to make his fortune from their work. Even his great supporter, Priest, was disappointed and hurt when he found out that Marconi was about to go it alone and set up his own company. Lodge and other scientists began a frenzy of patenting every tiny detail and improvement they made to their equipment. This new atmosphere shocked Bose when he returned to Britain. Bose wrote home to India in disgust at what he found in England. Money, 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 all the time. What a devouring greed. I wish you could see the craze for money of the people here. 
his disillusionment with the changes he saw in the country he revered for its scientific integrity and, and excellence is palpable. Eventually, though, it was his friends who convinced Bose to take out his one and only patent on his discovery of a new kind of detector for waves. It was this discovery that would lead to perhaps an even greater revolution for the world. He had discovered the power of crystals. This replaces older techniques using iron filings, which are messy and difficult and don't work well. And here's a whole new way of detecting radio waves, and it's one that's going to be at the centre of a radio industry. Bose's discovery was simple, but it would truly shape the modern world. When some crystals are touched with metal to test their electrical conductivity, they can show rather odd and varied behaviour. Take this crystal, for example. If I can touch it in exactly the right spot with the tip of this metal wire and then hook it up to a battery, it gives quite a significant current. But if I switch around my connection to the battery and try and pass the current through in the opposite direction, it's a lot less. It's not a full conductor of electricity. It's a semiconductor, and it found its first use in detecting electromagnetic waves. When Bose used a crystal like this in his circuits instead of the tube of filings, he found it was a much more efficient and effective detector of electromagnetic waves. It was this strange property of the junction between the wire, known as the cat's whisker, and the crystal, which allowed current to pass much more easily in one direction than the other, that meant it could be used to extract a signal from electromagnetic waves. At the time, no one had any idea why certain crystals acted in this way. But to scientists and engineers, the strange behaviour had a profound and almost miraculous practical effect. With crystals as detectors, now it was possible to broadcast and detect the actual sound of a human voice or music. In his Oxford lecture in 1894, Oliver Lodge had opened a Pandora's box. As an academic, he'd failed to foresee that the scientific discoveries he'd been such a part of had such commercial potential. The one patent he had managed to secure, the crucial means of tuning a receiver to a particular radio signal, was bought off him by Marconi's powerful company. Perhaps the worst indignation for Lodge, though, would come in 1909, when Marconi was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for wireless communication. It's difficult to imagine a bigger snub to the physicist who'd so narrowly missed out to Hertz in the discovery of radio waves, and who'd then go on to show the world how they could be sent and received. But despite this snub, Lodge remained magnanimous, using the new broadcasting technology that resulted from his work to give credit to others, as this rare film of him shows. Hertz made a great advance. He discovered how to produce and detect waves in space, thus bringing the ether into practical use, harnessing it, harnessing it for the transmission of intelligence in a way which has subsequently been elaborated by a number of people. Today, we can hardly imagine a world without broadcasting, to imagine a time when radio waves hadn't even been dreamt of. Engineers continued to refine and perfect our ability to transmit and receive electromagnetic waves, but their initial discovery 
was ultimately a triumph of pure science, from Maxwell through Hertz to Lodge. But still, the very nature of electricity itself remained unexplained. What created those electrical charges and currents in the first place? Although scientists were learning to exploit electricity, they still didn't know what it actually was. But this question was being answered, with experiments looking into how electricity flowed through different materials. Back in the 1850s, one of Germany's great experimentalists and a talented glassblower, Heinrich Geisler, created these beautiful showpieces. Geisler pumped most of the air out of these intricate glass tubes and then had small amounts of other gases pumped in. He then passed an electrical current through them. They glowed with stunning colours and the current flowing through the gas seemed tangible. Although they were designed purely for entertainment, over the next 50 years, scientists saw Geisler's tubes as a chance to study how electricity flowed. Efforts were made to pump more and more air out of the tubes. Could the electric current pass through nothingness, through the vacuum? This is a very rare flickbook film of the British scientist who created a vacuum good enough to answer that question. His name was William Crookes. Crookes created tubes like this. He pumped out as much of the air as he could so that it was as close to a vacuum as he could make it. Then, when he passed an electric current through the tube, he noticed a bright glow on the far end. A beam seemed to be shining through the tube and hitting the glass at the other end. It seemed at last we could see electricity. The beam became known as a cathode ray, and this tube was the forerunner of the cathode ray tube that was used in television sets for decades. Physicist J.J. Thompson discovered that these beams were made up of tiny, negatively charged particles. And because they were carriers of electricity, they became known as electrons. Because the electrons only moved in one direction, from the heated metal plate through the positively charged plate at the other end, they behaved in exactly the same way as Bose's semiconductor crystals. But whereas Bose's crystals were naturally temperamental, you had to find the right spot for them to work, these tubes could be manufactured consistently. They became known as valves, and they soon replaced crystals in radio sets everywhere. These discoveries would lead to an explosion of new technology. Early 20th century electronics is all about what you can do with valves. So the radio industry is built on valves. Early television is built on valves. Early computers are built with valves. These are the things that you build the electronic world with. Having discovered how to manipulate electrons flowing through a vacuum, scientists were now keen to understand how they could flow through other materials. But that meant understanding the things that made up materials, atoms. It was in the early years of the 20th century that we finally got a handle on exactly what atoms were made up of and how they behaved and so what electricity actually was on the atomic scale. At the University of Manchester, Ernest Rutherford's team was studying the inner structure of the atom and producing a picture to describe what an atom looked like. 
This revelation would finally help explain some of the more puzzling features of electricity. By 1913, the picture of the atom was one in which you had a positively charged nucleus in the middle, surrounded by negatively charged orbiting electrons in patterns called shells. Each of these shells corresponded to an electron with a particular energy. Now, given an energy boost, an electron could jump from an inner shell to an outer one. And the energy had to be just right. If it wasn't enough, the electron wouldn't make the transition. And this boost was often temporary because the electron would then drop back down again to its original shell. As it did this, it had to give off its excess energy by spitting out a photon. And the energy of each photon depended on its wavelength, or as we would perceive it, its colour. Understanding the structure of atoms could now also explain nature's great electrical light shows. Just like Geisler's tubes, the type of gas the electricity passes through defines its colour. Lightning has a blue tinge because of the nitrogen in our atmosphere. Higher in the atmosphere, the gases are different, and so is the colour of the photons they produce, creating the spectacular auroras. Understanding atoms, how they fit together in materials and how their electrons behave, was the final key to understanding the fundamental nature of electricity. This is a Winshurst machine, and it's used to generate electric charge. Electrons are rubbed off these discs and start a flow of electricity through the metal arms of the machine. Now, metals conduct electricity because the electrons are very weakly bound inside their atoms and so can slosh about and be used to flow as electricity. Insulators, on the other hand, don't conduct electricity because the electrons are very tightly bound inside the atoms and are not free to move about. The flow of electrons, and hence electricity, through materials was now understood. Conductors and insulators could be explained. What was more difficult to understand was the strange properties of semiconductors. Our modern electronic world is built upon semiconductors and would grind to a halt without them. Jagadish Chandra Bose may have stumbled upon their properties back in the 1890s, but no one could have foreseen just how important they were to become. But with the outbreak of the Second World War, things were about to change. Here in Oxford, this newly built physics laboratory was immediately handed over to the war research effort. The researchers here were tasked with improving the British radar system. Radar was a technology that used electromagnetic waves to detect enemy bombers. And as its accuracy improved, it became clear that valves just weren't up to the job. So the team had to turn to old technology. Instead of valves, they used semiconductor crystals. Now, they didn't use the same sort of crystals that Bose had developed. Instead, they used silicon. This device is the silicon crystal receiver. There's a tiny tungsten wire coiled down and touching the surface of a little silicon crystal. It's incredible how important a device it was. It was the first time silicon had really been exploited as a semiconductor. But for it to work, it needed to be very pure and both sides in the war put a lot of resources into purifying it. In fact, the British had better silicon devices 
So they must have had some growth of silicon already at that time, which we were just started with, you know, in, in Berlin. The British had better silicon semiconductors because they had help from laboratories in the US, in particular the famous Bell Labs. And it wasn't long before physicists realized that if semiconductors could replace valves in radar, perhaps they could replace valves in other devices too, like amplifiers. The simple vacuum tube with its one-way stream of electrons had been modified to produce a new device. By placing a metal grill in the path of the electrons and applying a tiny voltage to it, a dramatic change in the strength of the beam could be produced. These valves worked as amplifiers, turning a very weak electrical signal into a much stronger one. An amplifier is something, in one sense, really simple. You just take a small current, you turn it into a larger current. But in other ways, it changes the world, because when you can amplify a signal, you can send it anywhere in the world. As soon as the war was over, German expert Herbert Matterey and his colleague Heinrich Welke started to build a semiconductor device that could be used as an electrical amplifier. And here is that first working model that Matterey and Welke made. If you look inside, you can see the tiny crystal and the wires that make contact with it. If you pass a small current through one of the wires, this allows a much larger current to flow through the other one. So it was acting as a signal amplifier. These tiny devices could replace big, expensive valves in long-distance telephone networks, radios, and other equipment where a faint signal needed boosting. Matere immediately realized what he'd created, but his bosses were initially not interested. Not, that is, until a paper appeared in a journal announcing a Bell Labs discovery. A research team there had stumbled across the same effect, and now they were announcing their invention to the world. They called it the transistor. They had it in December 1947, and we had it in beginning 48. And, and but just 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 life, you know. Uh, they had it a little bit earlier. The effect, hmm. but funny enough, their transistors were just no good. Although the European device was more reliable than Bell Labs' more experimental model, neither quite fulfilled their promise. They worked, but were just too delicate. So the search was on for a more robust way to amplify electrical signals. And the breakthrough came by accident. In Bell Labs, silicon crystal expert Russell Ohl noticed that one of his silicon ingots had a really bizarre property. It seemed to be able to generate its own voltage. And when he tried to measure this by hooking it up to an oscilloscope, he noticed that the voltage changed all the time. The amount of voltage it generated seemed to depend on how much light there was in the room. So by casting a shadow over the crystal, he saw the voltage dropped. More light meant the voltage went up. What's more, when he turned a fan on between the lamp and the crystal, the voltage started to oscillate with the same frequency that the blades of the fan were casting shadows over the crystal. One of Ohl's colleagues immediately realized that the ingot had a crack in it that formed a natural junction. And this tiny natural junction in an otherwise solid block was acting just like the much more delicate junction between the end of a wire and a crystal that Bose had discovered except here it was sensitive to light. The ingot had cracked because either side contained slightly different amounts of impurities. One side had slightly more of the element phosphorus, while the other had slightly more of a different impurity, 
boron. And electrons seem to be able to move across from the phosphorus side to the boron side, but not vice versa. Photons of light shining down onto the crystal were knocking electrons out of the atoms. But it was the impurity atoms that were driving this flow. Phosphorus has an electron that is going spare. And boron is keen to accept another. So electrons tended to flow from the phosphorus side to the boron side, and crucially, only flowed one way across the junction. The head of the semiconductor team, William Shockley, saw the potential of this one-way junction within a crystal. But how would it be possible to create a crystal with two junctions in it? that could be used as an amplifier. Another researcher at Bell Labs called Gordon Teal had been working on a technique that would allow just that. He discovered a special way to grow single crystals of the semiconductor germanium. In this research institute, they grow semiconductor crystals in the same way that Teal did back in Bell Labs. Only here, they grow them much, much bigger. At the bottom of this vat is a container with glowing hot molten germanium, just as pure as you can get it. Inside it are a few atoms of whatever impurity is required to alter its conductive properties. Now, the rotating arm above has a seed crystal at the bottom that has been dipped into the liquid and will be slowly raised up again. As the germanium cools and hardens, it forms a long crystal like an icicle below the seed. The whole length is one single beautiful germanium crystal. Teal worked out that as the crystal is growing, other impurities can be added to the vat and mixed in. This gives us a single crystal with thin layers of different impurities, creating junctions within the crystal. This crystal with two junctions in it was Shockley's dream. Applying a small current through the very thin middle section allows a much larger current to flow through the whole triple sandwich. From a single crystal like this, hundreds of tiny solid blocks could be cut, each containing the two junctions that would allow the movement of electrons through them to be precisely controlled. These tiny and reliable devices could be used in all sorts of electrical equipment. You cannot have the electronic equipment that we have without tiny components. And you get a weird effect, actually. The smaller they get, the more reliable they get. It's a win-win situation. The Bell Labs team were awarded the Nobel Prize for their world-changing invention, while the European team were forgotten. William Shockley left Bell Labs and in 1955 set up his own semiconductor laboratory in rural California, recruiting the country's best physics graduates. But the celebratory mood didn't last long because Shockley was almost impossible to work for. People left his company because they just disliked the way he treated them. So the fact that Shockley was actually such a git is why you have Silicon Valley. It starts that whole process of spin-off and growth and new companies, and it all starts off with Shockley being such a shocking human being. The new companies were in competition with each other to come up with the latest semiconductor devices. 
they made transistors so small that huge numbers of them could be incorporated into an electrical circuit printed on a single slice of semiconductor crystal. These tiny and reliable chips could be used in all sorts of electrical equipment, most famously in computers. A new age had dawned. Today, microchips are everywhere. They've transformed almost every aspect of modern life, from communication to transport and entertainment. But perhaps just as importantly, our computers have become so powerful, they're helping us to understand the universe in all its complexity. A single microchip like this one today can contain around four billion transistors. It's incredible how far technology has come in 60 years. It's easy to think that with the great leaps we've made in understanding and exploiting electricity, there's little left to learn about it. But we'd be wrong. For instance, making the circuits smaller and smaller meant that a particular feature of electricity that had been known about for over a century was becoming more and more problematic. Resistance. A computer chip has to be continuously cooled. If you take away the fan, this is what happens. Wow, that's shooting up. 100, 120, 130 degrees. Two hundred degrees and it cut out. That just took a few seconds and the chip is well and truly cooked. You see, as the electrons flow through the chip, they're not just travelling around unimpeded, they're bumping into the atoms of silicon. And the energy being lost by these electrons is producing heat. Now, sometimes this was useful. Inventors made electric heaters and ovens. And whenever they got something to glow white hot, well, that's a light bulb. But resistance in electronic apparatus and in power lines is the major waste of energy and a huge problem. It's thought that resistance wastes up to 20% of all the electricity we generate. It's one of the greatest problems of modern times. And the search is on for a way to solve the problem of resistance. What we think of as temperature is really a measure of how much the atoms in a material are vibrating. And if the atoms are vibrating, then electrons flowing through are more likely to bump into them. So in general, the hotter the material, the higher its electrical resistance. And the cooler it is, the lower the resistance. But what happens if you cool something right down, close to absolute zero, minus 273 degrees Celsius? Well, at absolute zero, there's no heat at all. And so the atoms aren't moving at all. What happens then to the flow of electricity, the flow of electrons? Using a special device called a cryostat that can keep things close to absolute zero, we can find out. Inside this cryostat, in this coil, is mercury, the famous liquid metal. And it forms part of an electric circuit. Now, this equipment here measures the resistance in the mercury. But look what happens as I lower the mercury into the coldest part of the cryostat. There it is. The resistance has dropped to absolutely nothing. Mercury, like many substances we now know, have this property. It's called becoming superconducting, which means they have no resistance at all to the flow of electricity. But these materials only work when they're very, very cold. 
If we could use a superconducting material in our power cables and in our electronic apparatus, we'd avoid losing so much of our precious electrical energy through resistance. The problem, of course, was that superconductors had to be kept at extremely low temperatures. Then, in 1986, a breakthrough was made. In a small laboratory near Zurich, Switzerland, IBM physicists recently discovered her superconductivity in a new class of materials that is being called one of the most important scientific breakthroughs in many decades. This is a block of the same material made by the researchers in Switzerland. It doesn't look very remarkable, but if you cool it down with liquid nitrogen, something special happens. It becomes a superconductor. And because electricity and magnetism are so tightly linked, that gives it equally extraordinary magnetic properties. This magnet is suspended, levitating above the superconductor. The exciting thing is that although cold, this material is way above absolute zero. These magnetic fields are so strong that not only can they support the weight of this magnet, but they should also support my weight. I'm about to be levitated. Oh, it's a very, very strange sensation. When this material was first discovered in 1986, it created a revolution. Not only had no one considered that it might be superconducting, but it was doing so at a temperature much warmer than anyone had thought possible. We are tantalizingly close to getting room temperature superconductors. We're not there yet, but one day a new material will be found. And when we put that into our electronics equipment, we could build a cheaper, better, more sustainable world. Today, materials have been produced that exhibit this phenomenon at the sort of temperatures you get in your freezer. But these new superconductors can't be fully explained by the theoreticians. So without a complete understanding, experimentalists are often guided as much by luck as they are by a proper scientific understanding. Recently, a laboratory in Japan held a party in which they ended up dosing their superconductors with a range of alcoholic beverages. Unexpectedly, they found that red wine improves the performance of the superconductors. Electrical research now has the potential, once again, to revolutionize our world, if room temperature superconductors can be found. Our addiction to electricity's power is only increasing. And when we fully understand how to exploit superconductors, a new electrical world will be upon us. It's going to lead to one of the most exciting periods of human discovery and invention. A brand new set of tools, techniques and technologies to once again transform the world. Electricity has changed our world. Only a few hundred years ago, it was seen as a mysterious and magical wonder. Then it leapt out of the laboratory with a series of strange and wondrous experiments, eventually being captured and put to use. It revolutionized communication, first through cables and then as waves through electricity's far-reaching fields. It powers and lights the modern world. Today we can hardly imagine life without electricity. It defines our era and we will be utterly lost without it. And yet it still offers us more. We stand once again at the beginning of a new age of discovery, a new revolution.
But above all else, there's one thing that all those who deal in the science of electricity know. Its story is not over yet.